Well, you are most welcome to this uh, seminar uh, on uh, Eurasian and nationalist visions of uh, Russian future policy. And it's part of our series on domestic forces or factors behind Russian foreign policy. Um, the idea behind the series is to discuss domestic factors that may have an impact on Russian foreign policy and thereby the, the seminar can contribute to our understanding of triggers and constraints of policy. And at the uh, January seminar, um, then uh, we heard Lilia Shevtsova talk about the, uh, the shift of political ideological paradigm uh, in Russia during the last three years and how it forms the perceptions, uh, policy and behavior of the Putin regime. And uh, today we'll talk about ideological visions, uh, influential in Russian debates today, um, the geopolitical thinking of uh, Eurasianism and Russian nationalism of uh, various uh, shades and forms. And, and these visions, they may be instrumental to the Putin regime, but they may also have a dynamic of its own or of their own, uh, a dynamic that may cause serious challenges to, to the regi regime. And with us today we have uh, two specialists um, in the fields of Russian studies and the history of ideas. It's uh, uh, Professor Mark Bassin from Södertörns Högskola, and it's uh, Dr. Igor Tarbakov from uh, the Center of Russia Studies at Uppsala University, and Söderturn Högskola. Uh, and each speaker will have um, 25 minutes each and, and after that we will open the audience for open the floor to the audience for, for questions. So we start with Igor. So please, the floor is yours. Here. Thank you, Lena. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure and a privilege to speak within these hospitable walls. Uh, so let me open up with uh, couple uh, rather remarkable quotes. Back in 2008, uh, when uh, Vladimir Putin presented Dmitry Medvedev as his uh, successor, he described him and himself as the good Russian nationalist. Just very recently, in the very end of last year, Vladimir Putin characterized himself as Russia's top nationalist. But what does Putin actually mean? What kind of nationalism does he talk about? Civic, ethnic, imperial, Eurasianist, statist. I would argue that Russian nationalism is one of the most mythologized phenomena of contemporary Russia. It is either demonized or idealized but rarely analyzed as an extremely complex and diverse movement, or rather a set of various uh, nationalist discourses. And as a historian, uh, I would argue that we need a historical approach here to explore the broader dynamics of Russian nationalism, both before and after 1991. That is the year of the Soviet Union breakup. My main argument, or my main thesis, is this. The relationship between empire and nation lies at the heart of Russia's modern history. Of course, historically there were different types of empire. And I think that uh, Geoffrey Hosking, an eminent British historian, captured the nature of uh, this difference very nicely when he compared the British Empire and Russian Empire. Britain, Hosking said, had an empire. But Russia was an empire, and perhaps still is. Of course, the implication here is that it has always been difficult to tell where Russia proper began and where, uh, where Russia proper uh, ended and where empire began. Since the 19th century, notes Emil Pine, uh, Russia's uh, very prominent student of empire and nationalism, the history of Russia has been the history of empire that wanted to look like a nation state. Well, in Russia, as in any imperial polity, uh, 
the political understanding of nation posed before the people who espouse such conceptual approach, that is the Russian nationalists, two fundamental questions. First, who is Russian? Who is included in and who is excluded from the Narod, the Russian people? And the second question, how should the nationalists treat the imperial state? Is it their state in its entirety or not? I would submit that these two questions remained unresolved throughout both the imperial and Soviet periods of Russian history. Not only were the nationalists unable to agree on how to define what Ruski, Russian is, but they also found it difficult to identify with the imperial state, either Tsarist or Soviet, because it tended to distance itself from Russian ethnic nationalism, seeking to preserve a delicate balance in a culturally diverse and multi-ethnic polity. To be sure, Imperial bureaucrats could at times deploy Russian nationalist imagery and hijack nationalist rhetoric, like, for example, during late imperial period under the emperors Alexander III and Nicholas II, and again during late Stalinism. But most of them were conscious of the supranational nature of the state they governed. Thus, Tsarist Russia was very good at state building and empire building. But its inconsistent attempts at forging a multi-ethnic Russian nation within the formidable imperial shell failed miserably. Russian imperial bureaucrats didn't succeed in either creating a viable civic national identity based on pan-imperial citizenship or in forming a Russian ethnic nation based on Russian eth ethnicity. The Russian Empire story, argues Ron Suni, a prominent American historian, is one of the incomplete nation building. Likewise, the Soviet Union disintegrated within the context of its top leadership erratic attempts at turning this unique affirmative action empire into a more modernized and more democratic multi-ethnic state. So in both cases, Tsarist and Soviet, the tension and then conflict between imperial state and emerging Russian nation or society led to the collapse of the state. Now, when the empire ends, any empire, there are basically three modes in which the post-imperial community can be reimagined. Civic, ethnic, and neo-imperial. Russia's case is no exception. The country's liberals, clearly a minority faith, uphold the provisions of the 1993 constitution that characterize Russia as a civic community of Russian citizens, Rasiyani, enjoying equal rights throughout the entire territory of the country. For their part, Russian ethnic nationalists claim that the disintegration of the Soviet Union created, for the first time in Russian history, an opportunity to build a specifically Ruski, Russian nation, capitalizing on ethnic Russians' numerical strength within the borders of the Russian Federation. By contrast, the champions of empire, Ruski Imperts, as they are called in Russian, the empire saviors are the imperial nationalists, contend that Russia's current post-imperial condition is a mere prelude to the restoration of empire. They refer to the country's long-standing tradition, arguing that throughout its entire history, Russia has never been a nation-state, either ethnic or civic-centered, but has always been an empire. Remarkably, Russia's current post-imperial condition is deemed unsatisfactory by these two largest groups of Russian nationalists ethnic nationalists and imperial nationalists. While the imperative, the empire savers, regard the present day Russian Federation as a polity that is not imperial enough, Russian ethnic nationalists argue that the time has come to rid Russia of the residual vestiges of empire and build at long last a truly national state, the Russian state, Kasudarstva Ruskich, in which national minorities would live alongside the Russian master of the house. OK, uh, in today's Russia, there are several dozen nationalist and nationalistic groups, organizations, and parties. On latest count, something around 37, 40. But I'll focus today just on one strand of uh, the contemporary Russian nationalism, the so-called Nuts Dems, National Democrats which are represented by the National Democratic Party, headed by Konstantin Krylov, National Democratic Alliance, headed by Ilya Lazarenko, and the new force headed by 
my actually former school buddy, Valery Salavi. It is this particular strand of contemporary Russian nationalists, I would argue, that presents the biggest political and discursive challenge to the current Russian political regime. These Russian ethnic nationalists, the Nuts Dems, the National Democrats, contend that further debates between them and the empire savers, the imperial nationalists, are in fact pointless because history itself has resolved the empire nation dilemma for the Russians. They gave three reasons for this. First, the empire, so the last iteration of Russian empire, the Soviet Union, has disintegrated. Second, contemporary Russia, contemporary Russia simply lacks resources for legitimating imperial or any supranational power, as both dynastic and idiocratic principles are missing. And third, finally, following the Soviet Union's breakup, Russia has been profoundly reconfigured geopolitically. Having shed its imperial dominions, Russia has shrunk down to what the late geopolitical thinker Vadim Tsimbursky called, and I quote, its pre-imperial cultural and geographical core with solid and absolute Russian ethnic majority. These developments have radically changed the correlation between national and imperial project in Russian history, the Nuts Dams argue. Now there is no realistic imperial project that could be a viable alternative to the nationalist project. What remain, they say, are only the imperial phantom pains. It is noteworthy that intellectual leaders of the new generation of Russian ethnic nationalists clearly distinguish themselves from their predecessors, styling themselves as the third wave of the Russian nationalist movement. The first two waves being the so-called Russian party of the late Soviet period and the resurrected Eurasianism of the early 1990s. Symptomatically, one of their first tasks has been to explore the complicated relationship between Russian ethnic nationalism and the Russian imperial state. They hold that this relationship needs to be thoroughly reinterpreted. Here is a brief summary of their take on this issue. The Russian state, in all its historical forms, imperial, Soviet, and post-Soviet, has been and remains anti-national. Throughout Russian history, there existed an internal contradiction between the mass of Russian people and largely cosmopolitan imperial elite. The contradiction between the Narod, Russian people, and the elites seen by the common folk as the other generated an internal tension that would periodically burst out under the surface during the periods of Russian smuta, the recurrent times of trouble. Both in the 1917 revolution and in the 1991 political upheaval, there was an element of Russian national revolt against the empire. In both cases, it was a combination of cultural and social protest against the rulers whose outlook on the fundamentals of social life sharply differed from that of the Russian masses. The third wave ethnic nationalists have also made critical analysis of the Russian nationalist traditional approaches and found them wanting. First, unlike their predecessors, they clearly see the objective anti-imperial role of Russian ethnic nationalism. Russian nationalism undermined imperial loyalty in two ways. In the empire's borderlands, Russian nationalism stimulated the rise of other ethnic nationalisms, while in the Russian core lands, it was striving to make traditionally unconditional Russian loyalty to the state conditional, predicated on the Russian national character of the ruling regime. This is precisely the reason why both czars and communist commissars were wary of Russian ethnic nationalists. Second, the third wave nationalist thinkers correctly note that the objective anti-imperial role of Russian nationalism has never been properly understood by nationalists, nor would they draw logical conclusions from it. The thing is that, subjectively, Russian nationalists always wanted the impossible. They were longing for the Russian national state that at the same time would remain an empire. Thus, they ended up having contradictory relations with the state. They both challenged it and relied on it for support being unable to give up the empire, which they perceived as the most precious creation of the Russian people. Finally, the new cohort of nationalist thinkers conclude that historically, Russian nationalism has a contradictory and at times hostile attitude toward democracy. Objectively democratic character of nationalism and the ideology championing self-determination and people's sovereignty 
would almost never prompt Russian nationalists to rise against the authoritarian political system. The explanation is simple. Any attempt to realize full sovereignty for the Russians and the multi-ethnic land-based empire would inevitably lead to other ethnic groups within the states seeking to exercise the same right. <coughs> the result would be multiple secessions and the end of the imperial state, which Russian nationals believe are theirs too. Yet in a situation where the old empire, the Soviet Union, is gone, with a new imperial project looking increasingly practical, as it lacks both material and ideational resources, and with ethnic Russians now making up more than 80% of the country's population, the new generation nationalists seem to have fully embraced democracy. It's a very important development. Russian national state, their, leaders think, uh, their leading thinkers now contend, can be viable only if it is democratic. It would appear, though, that what ethnic nationalists really want is democracy of ethnic majority which would help them to impose their will on all those who, for whatever reasons, are not included into the Ruski in-group. They flatly reject the ostensibly civic term Rossiyani as completely useless, if not outright harmful, claiming that it has been introduced as a substitute of Soviet to again dissolve ethnic Russians in a supranational Rossiyski community. Furthermore, protection of minority rights rights does not figure prominently in their vision of the Ruski nation. However, to believe that the workings of democracy, one man, one vote, will do the trick for them, mostly because ethnic Russians constitute an overwhelming majority of the population, is naive. Any attempt to implement democracy of ethnic majority into practice in a multi-ethnic state is a recipe for disaster. One important implication of Russian ethnic nationalism embracing of democracy, even in this form, democracy of the majority, is that unlike the status imperial nationalists, they appear to be not hell-bent on preserving the territorial integrity of the present-day Russian Federation at all costs. By contrast, the creation of the democratic Russian national state, according to their view, might make the redrawing of the existing Russian state borders in certain cases inevitable. Some of the leading nationalist ideologues foresee the secession of Northern Caucasus, for instance, Russia's classical imperial possession, as well as the possible loss of other non-Russian territories during our lifetime. Yet, the territory of the Russian state might not only contract, it might also expand, not least because of Russian ethnic irredentism. Russia's conduct in Ukraine is the case in point. Russian official propaganda portrays the exploits of the so-called Russian rebels in Crimea and Novorossiya in unmistakably ethnic terms as the struggle to reconquer parts of Russia Irredenta. Notably, the land grab in Crimea and the policy of fomenting and supporting pro-Russian separatism in eastern Ukraine produced multiple and contradictory reactions on the part of Russian nationalist milieu. Some segments of ethnic nationalists, arguably the minority, appear to be greatly impressed by the manifestation of people's power in the Ukraine's Euromaidan and seek to distance themselves from the Kremlin's vicious anti-Ukrainian propaganda campaign and its reckless military adventures. While supporting the need to safeguard political and cultural rights for the Russians in Ukraine, some Russian nationalists have been quick to note Putin's hypocrisy the Kremlin's leader's sudden concern with the issue of self-determination of ethnic Russians in Ukraine seems to contradict his intent to suppress any genuine political competition within Russia itself. At the same time, the annexation of Crimea was enthusiastically supported by both the Imperci, the Empire Savers, and the bulk of ethnonationalists, all but for different reasons. While the former see the move as the first step towards the rebuilding of empire, the latter hail it as a successful example of the ethnic Russian Reconquista. Yet, if the Ukraine crisis and Russia's reaction to it caused some controversy among Russian ethnic nationalists, most of them share a rather dim view of Eurasian integration, which is clearly Vladimir Putin's pet project. The general consensus among them is that preventing what they see as the social degradation of Central Asian society as is futile, thus it is folly to seek an alliance with them. Simply stated, 
Russian nationalists believe Central Asia will drag Russia down. So, what is the Kremlin position? Where does Putin stand in all of this? So let's return to my first initial quote I gave you. Is he really a true nationalist as he claims to be? Well, uh, in all other highly divisive domestic issues, Putin's favorite operation mode is to preserve ambiguity. To be sure, the most recent gambit in Ukraine with the deployment of this notion of Ruski Mir, the Russian world, is a very dangerous policy. And uh, I remember that the leadership of who gave her talk in January pointed this fact. He also agreed that it's a tremendously dangerous policy, but a very uncharacteristic one. Uh, it is dangerous because it seeks to combine a near imperial course with the rhetoric of ethnicity. Yet ultimately, Putin is a classical государственник, державник, that is a statist, who preserves the uh, raison d'état and who seeks basically in all the cases to reaffirm the status quo. In all his programmatic statements, he's critical of both Russian ethnic nationalism and the ethnic nationalism of non-Russians. While deriding and trashing Western multiculturalism, Putin characterizes Russia as a multi-ethnic state civilization with Russian culture at its core, a country that is neither an ethnic state nor an American melting pot. He also defines the mission of the Russian people. On a number of occasions, he stated that the great mission of the Russian people is to, and I quote, unite and cement this unique state civilization. And that rhetoric brings Putin very closely to the rhetoric of the school of thought that is called Eurasianism. I'll stop here. Over to Mark. Thank you, Igor. Uh, questions will follow later. Um, yeah, please, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lena, for the kind invitation. I'm very delighted to be here. Igor has rather dramatically <laughs> ended his talk, and uh, I, I hope I can carry on in a, in a, a worthy fashion. Uh, the title of my talk, Eurasia Kak Planeta, Russia, the West, and the World. Eurasianism is one of the most popular keywords and concepts in political, public political discourses in the post-Soviet world, not just in Russia, but right across the former Soviet Union. It's a term that's encountered daily. Everybody has a view about it. Uh, many people endorse it. Uh, and one of the reasons that it's so popular is that it's something that can mean a lot of different things. So there's not just one Eurasianism, there are many Eurasianisms. Now, <clears throat> in my comments today, and I have to apologize here because um, in thinking as I was preparing these, I had a bit of a reality check, and I described originally a very broad uh, overview that I would give, but then I thought, I realized I was only speaking for half of a lecture, 25 minutes, so there's a bit of a time constraint, and I can't quite provide that overview. But what I want to do instead, which I think will be interesting, hopefully, and useful, is to focus on who is probably the most visible or inf an influential proponent of Eurasianism today, and this is the uh, <coughs> character Alexander Dugin, uh, who some of you, probably most of you, know about. A very po uh, visible figure now for some decades on the Russian scene, a political commentator, consultant, a political consultant, an activist, a writer, a now media personality. Most recently, he became an academic figure, a professor of sociology at the leading Russian institution, academic institution, Moscow State University, although I understand he's no longer there. In the 1990s, uh, Dugin, uh, if you sort of study the history of this, and he's someone I've been tracking for a very long time, uh, Dugin was in the extreme, it sort of was an extreme, was a fringe character in Russian extremist politics. But since the year 2000, since the accession of, of Vladimir Putin, he's increasingly moved into the mainstream, and he's become increasingly influential. So I think in talking about Dugin today is not quite the same as it was when I used to talk about Dugin a long time ago, where he really was an extremist. Now, uh, these, these, these ideas 
ideas are much more, uh, I think, I at least to some extent, in some way, in the mainstream. And what I want to do is to consider today a couple of his ideas to shed some light on what Eurasianism means, what his Eurasianism means, uh, in terms of Russia's relations with the West and Russia's relations with the world. Now, Eurasianism first took shape in the interwar period, the 1920s and 1930s, and it was formed by a group of Russian nationalists who were mainly academics, mainly intellectuals, who had fled the revolution. These were emigres, could not accept the uh, politics of Bolshevism. They regrouped in Western Europe and for two decades or a decade and a half uh, sat among themselves and thought about what they, well, they rethought the Russian history, the Russian experience, and what what uh, what should we do in the future? And they left behind an impressive legacy of books, polemics, and manifestos that was in the Soviet period suppressed and uh, to a very significant extent forgotten. We knew about them in the West. I've been studying myself the Eurasian uh, Eurasian since the 19, 1970s, but this was always sort of a curiosity and a very sort of uh, a marginal interest. But all of this changed in the late 1980s with Pity Stroika, because at this point Eurasianism was rediscovered and it reemerged and began to attract interest. This legacy that they had left behind it. The principal pro prophet of that, the principal proponent, was precisely Alexander Dugin. Dugin is of course aware that Eurasianism has a long tradition. That I just mentioned in the 20th century. It was he himself and his publishing houses that was responsible for, for, for publicizing, for producing, republishing these works and producing them. And indeed, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, achievement. Uh, there were many, there's many Eurasian works that I myself became familiar with only as he republished them in the 1990s that I hadn't known about before. So this was quite, uh, quite significant. And Dugan stresses this connection. He, it's an important aspect of his presentation. His strategy is to fit himself into this tradition of Eurasianism, going back to the what I, what I will call the classical Eurasian, Eurasianists of the 1920s and 1930s, to play up the ideological continuities between classical Eurasianism uh, uh, and himself to gain, in that way, to gain a kind of legitimacy. And this claim uh, extends to a range of complex issues. His interpretation of Russian history, the nature of Russian Eurasian culture and society, nationality problems in Russia, political organization, and so on, and so on. Two in particular here are fundamental. This understanding of the West that I talked about and the view of Russia Eurasia's place in the world. And it's these two that I make, uh, take today as the focus of my talk. And to look at Dugin, in a sense, in, in terms of this legacy of classical Eurasianism. And there are two points that I want to argue to begin with. Uh, Although in a general sense, Dugan repeats, repeats the classical Eurasian line, uh, the specifics of what he's saying and the implications of what he's saying can often be very different. And it's these differences, I think, at least in the examples that I'll talk about, rather than the similarities that, are the most, that have the most important implications for Russia's relations with the West and with the world. And the second point here that uh, uh, is not often uh, uh, acknowledged or recognized, but I think is significant, and that is that his neo-Eurasianism draws on more than just classical Eurasianism. There's more ideologically that's going on there, very importantly more, I would say, than just a simple taking over and reading and kind of redigesting of these, these books that he published from the 1920s and 1930s. Okay, so first we'll talk about Russia and the West. Dugin's neo-Eurasianism posits a fundamental, unbridgeable opposition between Russia and the West. Now, this was a fundamental element of classical Eurasianism as well. And the classical Eurasians in the 1920s were only themselves continuing what had already become very established as tradition in Russian nationalism from the 19th century. You have uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky as an example of that. More important to the to the to the Eurasianists, the classical Eurasianists were such pan Slavs as uh, Nikolai Dalievsky, Konstantin. Leontiev. They describe differences from the West, Russia's differences from the West, not in national or ethno-national terms, which was more typical in the West, where you distinguish the German from the French and so on, but rather in what they called terms of, civil, of culture or civilization, the term that we use today. And the, their way of thinking about it is very much similar uh, to the way it u is used today. And if you read the book by uh, uh, by uh, Samuel Huntington, Clash of Civilizations, it's essentially talking about the same sorts of, of entities. Drawing actually, interestingly, very much on what originally were uh, Danilevsky's ideas from the, 19, from the, 18, uh, from the uh, 19th century. Now, for the classical Eurasians, the West, when they talked about Zapad or the West, it was understood traditionally as Russian nationalism before them had always understood it. That is to say, it was the European West. 
And the model for this, Donlievsky had come up with this idea of Romano-Germanic civilization. This was a civilization of the West, dominated, of course, by these Western European, West European national entities of, uh, of uh, Germany and France. Uh, he called it uh, this uh, Romano-Germanic cultural zone. Now, in particular, this referred to a cluster of empires or great powers that Russia had compared itself with since the times of Peter the Great. Britain, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, Austro-Hungarian, and the Iberian empires. And for two centuries, this West, this European West, was the other, the critical other for Russia. It was loved or was hated, but it was always something Russia could define itself against. Now, all of this is familiar. This is just standard Russian nationalist thinking. This sense... Dugin has a fundamentally different understanding of the West. He accepts the historical reality of the Romano-Germanic civilizational zone and the historical significance of its opposition to Russia, but he updates it to reflect the essential global shifts that occurred after 1945, or between 1945 and 1991. And above all, this is the shift of the center of gravity of the West, or of the Zapad, across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. For Dugin, it is now the United States and not Western Europe that represents Eurasia's, his Eurasia's antithesis or chief opponent. Indeed, Eurasianism is now defined in precisely the terms of the Cold War, that is to say, its opposition to the world's sole remaining superpower or the United States. This opposition to the West is formulated specifically as uh, the, as I say, the opposition to the superpower, and he calls this Atlanticism. And this is this sort of geopolitical concept that he has, that he has created, Atlanticism, and a clear indication here of the transatlantic character of the entity that he's talking about. The United States, of course, in, 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 in smaller letters, the UK would have to uh, be, uh, goes on top of that, also Atlanticist in the sense, but the focus here, of course, is the United <laughs> States, the Atlanticist power base. And Dugan argues that a clear, the clear program, this Atlanticist power base, has a clear program for the future that is to achieve total global hege hegemony in what he and uh, other Russians refer to as the uh, Novi Miravoy Paryadak, the no New World order. A plan, in other words, for the conquest of, uh, global, of global space. Eurasia's, from this standpoint, Eurasianism's principal task is to prevent the United States from achieving this hegemony. Instead, to establish a global system that is moly, uh, multiple or polycentric. And Dugan, and I quote him, the most, the most important historical task of Eurasianism is to provide the world with a common platform for the struggle against Atlanticism in favor of a multipolar world. Now, all of this was completely absent from classical Eurasianism. There was no serious attention in classical Eurasian, among the classical Eurasians to the United States at all. So to this extent, Dugan has significantly reformulated or rewritten Eurasian doctrine. The two points here, I think, are significant. To begin with, the West is no longer a civilization. It's no longer a community of nations. Rather, it is represented by a single country. The United States and all of the all of the uh, uh, vassal states around it, and significantly, this world's remaining superpower now stands alone. A kind of Atlanticist. Well, you have the exception of, of Britain and other countries around it, but a kind of Atlanticist exceptionalism. Indeed, after the Cold War, Dugan uh, uh, Dugan maintains the United States operates quite apart from, and in fact, in de facto opposition to its former allies in Western and Central Europe. It's highly indicative of this fact is that he doesn't use the he himself doesn't use the term West or Zapad uh, a, a great deal. Again, uh, being more uh, using the more specific term, more more accurate from his standpoint, and that is of uh, Atlanticist. Now, the, the second point here, the more important one, is that continental Europe, in terms of the shift, this this geo geo mental shift in his head, continental Europe loses its traditional identity or its traditional function as Russia's antithesis or its defining other. And it's looked at now rather differently, in fact, uh, uh, much more benignly, and in fact, Europe can now be, Western Europe can now be a potential ally. And this is very much Dugin's approach. So Dugin can be supportive or enthusiastic of the European Union. He talks about that sometimes, or has talked about it, as a kind of geopolitical model for Eurasia. And he believes that Europe has also become, Western Europe has also become an object to America's hegemonic strivings, as, as vulnerable to this new world order domination as any other part of the world. 
So all of these strategic imperatives in his head combine together to form the, a potential basis for a future alliance between uh, a future alliance of Europe with Russia and Eurasia. This is expressed in his vision of a Paris, Berlin, Moscow axis. And something that sounds a little crazy, but uh, he takes it very seriously, writes about it at great length. And one of the most sensational maps, he, Dugan is a great kind of uh, uh, informal cartographer and his, his work is filled with these kind of maps that he's drawn himself. But one of his earliest ones is not one that he drew himself. In fact, it was adorned the cover of a publication from I think 1992. And it's a map of, 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 of Europe or Eurasia, where uh, including Russia and Western Europe. And he says, he talks about the new Euro-Asiatic empire, Dublina da Vladivostoka. This is kind of painted on the map from Dublin to Vladivostok as one sort of great political entity. This position is not simply absent from classical Eurasianism, it completely contradicts its spirit. And so here we have to look for other sources. Where is this coming from? Well, Dugan takes this not from classical Eurasianism, but rather from the ideologies of the extreme European extreme right, from this notion that is developed called Euroasia a vision of organic or geographical and geopolitical unity of Europe and Asia, whereby Asia is seen mainly in terms of Eurasian, Russian Eurasian space. This idea dates from the early 20th century. It was a highly influential formation of this notion came from the German, uh, not German, from the British geographer, political geographer and statesman, Halford Mackinder, who talked about the dangers of this coming together, of this uh, Eurasian, but now including Western Europe, of this Eurasian uh, macro force taken together. Arguably, the Versailles uh, uh, arrangements, which included this uh, uh, cordon sanitaire in Eastern Europe, was intended to separate precisely Western Europe from Russia, so there could be no, so that there could be no collusion. And this idea was very influential in World War II, where the German geopoliticians adopted the same notion of a fundamental, sort of essential alliance or unity between the European West and uh, uh, and Russia to create this greater continental. Uh, powerful uh, uh, transcontinental entity. They accepted Haushoff, they accepted Mackinder, but inverted it so that now this was positive. And of course, you got then you had the, the German geopolitician Haushofer with this idea of continental block, of continental block, uh, which then he was able to convince the Nazi elite. And this is uh, what came into being for two years from 1939. During the Cold War, all of this was over, of course, but the idea was kept alive in the European. Nouvelle Droit, the New Right, and one of the proponents of the Nouvelle Droit, the Belgian, the Belgian writer Jean Thuriard, was the one who originally drew that map. It was from Thuriard, excuse my French, that uh, uh, Dugan took over this map of the uh, empire from Dublin to a uh, very evocative, I must say, map of M uh, Dublin to uh, Vladivostok. Also another proponent, Alain de Benoit, the, one of the uh, leaders of the French uh, New Right. And this idea has emerged quite powerfully in the post-Cold War world. The breakdown of the great power blocks has uh, allowed this to re-emerge and to flourish. And Dugan, of course, has extensive uh, connections and collaborations with the European New Right and has picked it up from then. But this perspective, uh, is not only on this the extremist right. It begins on the extremist right, but it has very practical implications, a very practical policy pot uh, potential. I can just remind you about uh, uh, in 2003, and this is the preparations for the Iraq war, and just remember for a moment how the breakdown was, how the European political breakdown was in terms of support or opposition for what the United States, what George Bush in the United States was trying to do. And of course, you remember that the West European uh, uh, polity was a uh, political opinion there. It was very much against it, very much against that. And Dugan saw this and welcomed, this was this, and then Donald Rumsfeld talked about, remember, New Europe and Old Europe and all of this, this stuff. And Dugan looks at this and there's not much he can do, but he's delighted. And this is confirming to him, this is exactly what these divisions are and that the, the real alliance here is with, uh, to the east, with Russia. Okay, so the next point, I, I, the second point I want to talk about is the vision of Russia Eurasia's place in the world. Classical Eurasianism identifies the organic unity of Eurasian space, 
And by the, the uh, 1920s, 1930s, they understood Eurasia as being basically, and you can take this fairly literally, the, Russian, the space of the Russian Empire without Poland, without Finland, but basically the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, as it then by mid-1920s uh, became uh, uh, geopolitically reassembled. And the classical Eurasians stressed the organic unity of this space. It was an absolutely distinctive geographically, culturally, historically, politically, cultural, uh, distinctive cultural zone. It differed in fundamental ways from all of the other regions of the globe, and in particular those adjacent to it along its long boundary. The organic, this organic coherence of Russian Eurasian space was the basis of their vision of it as a closed ge geographical universe. What one of the Eura classical Eurasians, a geographer, an economist by the name of uh, Savitsky, Pyotr Savitsky, referred to it as a mir v sibie, a world in itself, completely self-contained. In Russian Eurasian space alone, there was all of the physical and spiritual resources that were necessary to maintain independence for it to live by itself, completely self uh, uh, self-contained. So classical Eurasianism then, from this standpoint, was a radically isolationist doctrine. Its goal was full national political autonomy and economic self-sufficiency. Now in this, and I remind you, it was in the interwar period, the 1920s and 1930s, it had great affinities and doubtless was influenced by other etatist ideas that were circulating, and some very powerfully so, in Europe at the time. This notion of national autarky, uh, 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 and in particular, of course, that of German autarky, which was, became a sort of dominant in Germany after 1993, and the, in 1933 rather, and the concept in Germany of Middle Europa, and they contrasted or compared their vision of Eurasia to the German vision of Middle Europa. And of course, not to be forgotten was the fact that by this time, the Soviet Union itself was dominated by a radically isolationist uh, approach and uh, isolationist understanding. This was the idea of socialism in a single country, which was also very influential. So there was, a, there was a, a concurrence at the time in this type of isolationism. There was nothing exceptional about what the Eurasians were doing. Dugan's neo-Eurasianism, on the other hand, presents a very different vision, or an entirely different vision, of Russia's place in the world. He's not isolationist, rather it's a genuinely global, very contemporary, once again, very recognize very much what's going on, uh, the ideas and perspectives we have in the world today, global, globalized perspectives, at the center of which is Dugan's own version of this, uh, of a Eurasian new world, his own Eurasian new world order. A complex model for the future geopolitical reorganization of the entire world. And he sees this, and you can kind of see this in his books, and he has these maps and diagrams again, an association of four macro geographical regions. What Dugan refers to as big, uh, big spaces, Africa, Asia Pacific, the Americas, and Eurasia. This particular arrangement that, are, that, that exists together in some sort of uh, uh, arrangement, uh, this reflects the polycentricity that he is so uh, insistent on, the dominant mode, and that would be the dominant mode of geopolitical power at the global level. The Berlin, the Paris-Berlin-Moscow axis that I mentioned uh, in this larger scheme is only one element, and it would be augmented and extended through vectors, stress, uh, thrusting in other directions, thrusting south to Central Asia, the creation of a Tehran-Moscow axis, and stretching to the Far East to create a Tokyo-Moscow axis as well. So in the final analysis, Dugin subordinates, or at least relegates, his concern with Russia-Eurasia per se, within a, a more comprehensive and ambitious, and again, I say global, globalist, uh, globalized scheme of the rearrangement of geopolitical relations right across the globe. And again, this is something that goes entirely beyond classical Eurasianism, which, as I said, was isolationist and self-sufficient. Well, once again, we ask, where do these ideas come from? And I think, once again, uh, classical Eurasianism doesn't give us any help here, so we turn to these ideas of European conservatism, European radical conservatism, and that have come back in the European New Right. Dugan's term, Balshoye uh, Prastranstva, many of you, I think, will already pick up on this. This is his literal translation, uh, accurate translation, of the German term Großraum which maybe means a little bit more to uh, many uh, people in the audience, a concept that was developed in interwar geo geopolitik, geopolitics in Germany, in particular in the theories of uh, Carl Schmitt, who of course was the uh, uh, theorist, one of the important theorists for the Nazis, and the geopolitician Karl Haushofer. And it was Haushofer's scheme of, uh, of four macro regions, four Großräume, that would cover the whole earth that Dugan has taken over, and I have to say, practically unaltered. <laughs> 
So with all of this, we've really left isolationism, the, the isolationism of classical Eurasianism behind. Eurasia now becomes, in his projection, a universal project, a globalized project, one that represents the entire world. And subtitling a manifesto that he wrote, this is he started a political movement, and he had a Eurasian party, and he wrote a manifesto for this in 2002, confirming these ideas. And it is subtitled as manifesto, Eurasia kak planeta, Eurasia as the planet. Dugan couldn't have put the point I'm making any more explicitly. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, for these very interesting presentations. Uh, before opening um, the f floor to the audience, um, I would like Mark maybe to say a few words. I mean, um, Igor, he tried to um, well give a picture of uh, how the Putin regime has um, try to uh, include different elements from the nationalist discourse. And what would you say about um, uh, the Putin regime s uh, using selected concepts from, from, uh, from the Eurasianists? Because, I mean, you can see that they are to different uh, degrees they have been in included, but some parts have not been included, and others have been, well, exaggerated. Yes. What would you say? Well, it's a very relevant question because, indeed, Putin has embraced Eurasianism in a way. I mean, now this mm -hmm. is official. Again, I've been watching this for a very long time, uh, not alone with my colleagues who have always been interested since the 1990s, really, in looking at how these ideas are playing out and what is Dugan doing and, you know, remaining on the fringe. Uh, uh, and Putin uh, uh, was always interested in Eurasianism, and he's, he, his encounter with it uh, focused on the project that actually began not in Russia at all, but began in Kazakhstan with uh, the Nazarbayev, President Nazarbayev, who embraced Eurasianism in a very explicit way, uh, um, uh, sort of as an explanation of history, but also as a project of the future, and began in the mid, or even earlier, 1994, 1993, 1994, began advocating what he called a Eurasian, tried to take this idea, this vision of Eurasia, and put it into a practical plan for the future in the form of a Eurasian economic union. So this is very much a Nazarbayev idea. And uh, the, from the 1990s, and of course, as you, I think we appreciate, this involves a kind of, it, at that time, the Commonwealth of Independent States was still pretty, was still new and kind of had not been discredited or sort of forgotten the way that it has become. And so the Euro Eurasian Economic Union was seen as a sort of an alternative to that or a supplement to that, that is a bringing the space together. It was fairly indistinct. Um, uh, but, but gathered a strength through the years. And the point with Putin, to come back to Putin, is that from the beginning, from 2000, from the moment he came in, he inherited, tacitly, tacitly supported this project. Uh, he was very careful, I've just been writing about this, he was extremely careful about the way he spoke about it. He didn't mention it in Moscow. He would go to Kazakhstan and give lectures there. I mean, speak there. He would have uh, meetings and he would give lectures. And there he would talk about Eurasia. He would talk about uh, this uh, Eurasianist, one of the Soviet uh, uh, developers of this idea, Gumilyov, Lev Gumilyov. And he didn't mention Gumilyov in Moscow, but when he went to Kazakhstan, where they had named a university after Gumilyov, he said Gumilyov was a great kind of, his ideas are exciting the masses and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and this developed more and more, there was an undertone in his, uh, in his um, thinking and his, ex his, his expressions that got stronger and stronger. And then finally, of course, in the run up to the, elect in, the in the campaign for his third presidency, he came out and he made an, what was quite a dramatic, and I guess some of you uh, kind of remember that or aware of that, he made a very dramatic statement when he was letting out what his foreign policy priorities would be. And here he finally endorsed the notion of a geopolitical, of a, of a Eurasian Union, something that he had, again, he had always supported but never endorsed. Uh, I was uh, met with Putin on a couple of occasions, and on one occasion, uh, just to, I asked him about Eurasia, I asked him about the importance of Eurasianism, and his, he, he refused to even acknowledge, he refused sitting there with a group of sort of Western in the Kremlin, he wouldn't even answer the question. He was, it was that sensitive, that's how I see it now. At the time, I, was, I wasn't sure. But seeing it now, I see that he simply didn't want to talk about it, to take a stand in Moscow, in that particular context. Uh, but, but now he has taken a clear stand against it, so um, uh, in f favor of it. Now, this relates to Russian nationalism, and it very directly relates to what Igor was talking about, because it is a particular vision. It's not an ethno-national vision. It is a vision of, uh, uh, I mean, it's a kind of post-imperial vision. It's a, vi it's a multinational vision. It's a vision of a unity. This, and this was the original Eurasian vision, uh, a vision of unity. 
Um, but, and the important thing here, I think, from the, from the question about his view of, of, of nationalism, is that his, this is an idea of the Russian nationality, Ruskia, playing, this is the, this is the backbone, as he called the stierzhen, that's a word I learned, actually, just in connection with this work that I'm doing here, the backbone, that, that the Russian element here is the most important. Fascinatingly, if you go back into this, what I was talking about, the doctrines of Eurasianism back to the original Eurasians, they also struggled with this, with this problem of how do you, how do you, you know, the Russia is not an empire. You cannot have an imperial relationship. They said this very explicitly. You can't be a Russian chauvinist uh, to their, to their, you know, Russian emigrate, their fellow emigrants sitting there in, in Paris and in Sofia and wherever they were sitting. You, you have to understand that it's international and we are an international community. But then what is the relationship of Russia actually? And that they could never quite settle on that. And the notion of Russia as a first among equals was always, was always there. And Putin now, and, and not just Putin, this is, the, this is uh, basically Russian Eurasianism. Dugin is also ambivalent on this point, but basically you have there a very strong element of a, uh, of a notion of, of uh, first among equals. A little bit the way that Russia always was anyway in the Soviet Union. So that's, that's uh, I think, what I would say about that. Very, very affirmative. I just I'll say, make one more point. Uh, I talked about his uh, statement about Eurasia, the Eurasian Union, in his campaign. He then, that was in, I think, October. That was the first one. It was in Izvestia. Uh, and it, it was, the, you know, in, there was international reaction to those of us following it were kind of interested in that. Later on in the campaign, some, some months later, he had another statement. He produced a series of them. And this other one dealt with nationality problems. And here, if you read this, it's actually much more revealing than his statement about Eurasia, which is not very revealing. His statement about Russian nationality problems is clear, and he makes very clear the leading role that he thinks the Russian, eth ethnic Russian, element, which of course is what, 82%, I mean it's the dominant, uh, very large majority in the country, this is the, this is the element that the, the country has to circle, has, has to center around and has to be the, uh, in, in a sense, the most important. Well, one more, one more question. Um, I mean, Igor, in his introduction, he talked about this um, uh, imperial, nationalist, and civic uh, way of understanding mm -hmm. Russian and Russia. And I mean, you had talked about the imperialist and, and the nationalist and his different variations. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and Putin has to, 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 to try to find a balance between this and picking and selecting. However, what would you say about the potential of the civic? And, and now I'm not talking about a, a kind of democratic uh, version of it. No. But well, you mentioned Carl Schmitt. Yes. If you would say then an authoritarian, rational way of, of, of giving priority to the state, uh, uh, having an identity with the state, and, and this, well, the issue of ethnics or religion would be, well, uh, not that important because it would be the state, state interest on top of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, would, I mean, it, uh, it exists already, but would, would, uh, would you see in the future that this could develop into one, how to say, an alternative to uh, these other two options? Uh, uh, I mean, for, uh, just for, uh, for are understanding about Russia. Are you asking about Putin or this yeah. as an independent? As something... No, 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 I'm just... For government position. Government position. Or if there is anything that could be said about, I mean, speculations. However, well, uh, the trends. I mean, anything can change. I think what Putin said in his electoral campaign that I've described a little bit is not what he would have said five years earlier. I think he would have had a different line five years earlier. Maybe five years from now, it'll evolve into something else. So, I, and I don't have a vision. I think Putin. We all know he's a, a pragmatist, right? You know, and, and, and you know, and everyone changes, but Putin certainly as much as anybody, depending on what seems to be useful and, and effective at any given moment. But in line, in, in in the spirit of what he said in the electoral campaign, and I think what he still says today. Um, it's not really, it's civic. I mean, it's multinational, and there's a, this is what Eurasianism has always been about. It's been about recognizing, in a sense, the multinationality and the integrity of the multinational. It's, not, it's very much not a question of, a, of one dominating imperial peoples that then conquers and organizes others. So uh, it's been that, but it's one that rests on this assumption that the Russians are a leading, are the leading people, or they're this backbone. And I guess the question is, when Putin uses the word Stierzhen, we have to go to him and say, tell us, Vladimir Vladimirovich, what do you mean by Stierzhen? And then we'll begin to, you see, it plays on a kind of ambiguity, I think, that's critical, but it's not, it's not civic. 
And um, uh, I think civic, this gets us a little bit into a different question, but you had very much stronger movement in that direction in the 1990s. And that was exemplified, by example, in the idea that you would call, you would get rid of these terms and you would introduce a new term that was non ethnic, non ethno national, to designate. There could be a term to designate the citizens of the country. I, many of you, I guess, remember, know what I'm talking about. This is the term, the Russian term, Rasiski, as opposed to Ruski, Rasiski. And then, now Rasiski is the adjective, but the individual, Rasianin which sounds, uh, sounded at the time a little bit strange because it was historical, but they, they resurrected this term to refer to people who were ci basically citizens of the Russian. It used to mean, Rasianin used to mean someone, a, a, a subject of the empire who was not of Russian nationality. So Rasianin meant the Yakuts or people like that. But now Rasianin was supposed to be everybody as a citizen. And this, this uh, was opposed by uh, very, very uh, across the board uh, by lots of people, I think, but it, it was opposed by Russians uh, this mentality that we're talking about precisely because this seemed to suggest that there was not this leading element, that that wasn't there. It was not important to make the, uh, the, 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 the leading character of this ethnic element um, uh, apparent. So that's how I see things at the moment. Uh, whether, where this develops is, is you know, impossible to say, I think. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll just you know, add a little bit and pick up exactly where uh, Mark left off. Uh, I, I wouldn't hold my breath. Or about the development of uh, this idea, and, and simply because uh, there is a difficult barrier <coughs> that needs to be overcome. And this barrier, uh, Mark has just alluded to, and this is the legacy of ethnic federalism. Mm. So what to do with that? In, in, in fact, everyone, all strands of Russian nationalism, you know, the marginalized liberals, you know, who uphold civic uh, nationalism, imperialists, and Russian ethnonationalists are all against this legacy, you know, for, for different reasons. But, you know, how to uh, overcome that? Because there are strong vested interests. How you deal with the ethnocracy in, in Kazan, or in Ufa, or in the you know, statelets of uh, Northern Caucasus. They wouldn't give it up. And in fact, they use it very heavily in their negotiations and haggling with the Kremlin. And it's a two-way street because it, it, in a way the, the Putin administration also uses this. Just look at the it's just completely, it's an imperial-like relationship between the Kremlin and Grozny, <coughs> between Putin personally and Ramzan Kadyrov personally. It's not even sort of imperial-like, it's a feudal type of relationship. So but it's, it, it, it's, it's a dramatic legacy mm. that is left uh, from the practices of managing multi-ethnicity during the Soviet period. And uh, this legacy has deep roots. In, in fact, there was one instance, and uh, I think in one of my recent oracles, I refer to uh, that very, very curious incident when uh, Yuri Andropov, it's basically on his deathbed, summoned several advisors basically Arkady Volsky and Evgeny Velikov, and ask them to redraw the map of the Soviet Union whereby the ethnic federalism would be replaced by non-ethnic divisions. He said, basically, draw me a map whereby the Soviet Union would consist approximately of 40 to 50 states, not ethnic-based. But then it was a race against time. I mean, uh, actually, uh, Volsky and Vilikov, you know, went back to their offices, went, went to their drawing boards, and they tried to sort of, you know, draw these maps. And when apparently, you know, that project was ready, and Dropov was dead. And as a number of historians say, probably it was the last moment in, in the history of Russia when a powerful leader was powerful enough 
to deal with that kind of legacy. Yeltsin could not do this. You, you remember how he started his presidency? He basically gave free hand. Mm. The, the, the period between like 1991 and 1995 or 1996 was called the parade of sovereignties. That was the only way for him to keep the huge diversity together, to haggle with the ethnic leaders <coughs> in these republics. So Putin is, is very cautious. I mean, he, he, I think he understands that you know, no matter how much he would like to get rid of this legacy. I, I, I'm sure that deep in his heart, he, mean, he would be happy to do that. He cannot, I mean. Hmm. Igor, I think the story about Andropov is a very interesting one, but I'm not sure Andropov, uh, even Andropov, would have been in a position to. Well, I mean, it's. it's, it's, it's uh, think, uh, oh, you have to I, 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 I'm, I'm speculating. Man. I, I, I can give you, I can Igor, give you the name he was of. Not the first, he was not the first Soviet leader to have this idea about getting rid of the ethnic. Ba ethically based uh, federal subject. Yeah, I, I know, but Nikita, you know, I, I no, get no, this example. No, no, it's very relevant till today, to I, today yeah, yeah, because know. Nikita Khrushchev had the same idea, I, I, no, and the Khrushchev I, I, I did try, example. unlike yeah. Andropov, Khrushchev did try to do something, and he did something, and that's with us very much. Well, well, yeah, but he, he, he would have he 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 anyway. This was how it was the idea <laughs> of, of, uh, of de-ethnicizing yeah, territory was how Crimea ended up being part of Ukraine as a part of being Russia yeah, in 1954. Can, can I agree with you more? I, I gave this example. And what happened to Khrushchev? And what, so well, related, I think. Here, here you are. <laughs> but he, he, he would have succeeded. Well, maybe 